my name is Carly Wonderlich. I don't know if I had a chance to introduce myself at all to you yet, but I'm the content specialist at Penn Emblem. Um, we're a 74 year old textile manufacturing and full service brand decoration company. And obviously, like I said, you know, this is a recent partnership with us with James Emin and Company and working with you as well, Tiffany. And being that it's Autism Awareness Month and Diversity Awareness Month, we figured what better time would it be to spread more awareness and bring more education to the platform. Um, so today we're speaking with James Emmett, a corporate disability consultant and founder of the James Emmett and Company. He, is, uh, he and his team have worked with major companies such as Walgreens, Best Buy, Pepsi, UPS, um, changing the way that businesses recruit, hire, train people with disabilities, in turn creating a more inclusive workplace. So we've had a lot of fun working with you and then people have been name dropping Tiffany like crazy saying that you've been so helpful in the process. Um, so obviously I have the pleasure of speaking with you as well today. So a global expert in neuro neurodiversity, which I'm excited to learn more about, um, international speaker, LinkedIn author and university lecturer. So um, also the founder of Grit and Flow. So I'm definitely excited to hear from both of you. Um, if you don't mind just giving a little bit more of both of your backgrounds, if I didn't touch on it. James, if you want to start off. Yeah, so thanks, Carly, for having, for having me and having us. Um, so I'm James Emmett. Yeah, as you said, I'm the owner of James Emmett and Company, and you summarized it pretty well. We work with um, large, mostly large-scale um, corporations, um, primarily in the manufacturing, logistics, and food production industries. Um, other disability inclusion consultants do other industries, but we tend to specialize in those industries. Um, I've been in disability employment since I was 18 years old, so I've been doing this for a very long, very long time. Um, opened the James Eminent Company about six years ago to meet the growing demand for companies really looking at um, thinking about a loyal labor and building disability inclusion into as a, as a strategy. As you said. I've had the pleasure of working with large companies like Walgreens, like UPS, um, like Pepsi, Office Max, Cummins, and helping them to build out uh, their disability inclusion efforts. Um, but you know, it's it's been great to work with Penn Emblem. Uh, we love the flexibility. We love the perspective. We love the leadership that Randy brings to the table. So. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and as you said, none of this could have been successful without our California focus and the partnership that yeah. Tiffany and Grit and Flo have, have brought to the table to help us through this. So I'll turn it over to her. Thank you. Hey, you pretty much read my LinkedIn profile. So <laughs> I thought I did. Um, but my, I'm a little more untraditional of getting into this field is um, my training actually was a product manager for software company. I was a programmer. Um, and then came the time when I stayed home to have children and my oldest son was diagnosed with autism and eventually my daughter with ADHD. Um, as time went on, it was time to not helicopter and let them fall a little bit. Um, and I went back and got my MBA. As I was concluding that, I was doing a, a business plan. I decided to do it on something related to autism. And I found out about an 85% unemployment rate for people with autism and possibly higher for college educated. And my son is in college now. Um, and I, I was called to action and I was like, this isn't okay. So I changed my focus um, from what I was going to do with my MBA into organizational psychology, which I'm finishing up my PhD right now. Um, and I spent the last three years building grit and flow with really the purpose is to make inclusion for all, for people and companies to accept people for their true selves and to be able to allow them to bring their best selves to work and work how they work best. Um, and so it's been exciting to be with Penn Emblem because um, James pulled me into this opportunity and it's a dream job for me to have, you know, people who are so willing to embrace um, the individual person to make them successful. So it's been a lot of fun. Good. Yeah, I, I heard the exact same thing on our end as well. They've just really been enjoying the process and they were telling me about something. Um, I think it was one of your recommendations, Tiffany, correct me if I'm wrong, but just the change in our hiring process. We did something called, I believe it was a work-based interview. So they created this box, put different emblems in it, um, just different tools to actually see what these people are capable of doing, not just sitting there having a, a dialogue back and forth, which I thought was really different and cool. Well, what we did, um, what we found, and I think this is with anybody, not just this particular group that we're targeting, is that these jobs don't really make sense on paper. So how can you say I'm a single head operator? How can you say I'll be a good clipper? How can you say right. they make no sense? Um, and so even me, I've been there for three months and I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> so when we bring people in, what we try to do is say, 
this is the job requires these fine motor skills. These jobs require that you um, do a repetitive task. These jobs require that you have a lot of critical thinking, like a DE embroiderer has to like problem solve how to put that thing on that machine. And we broke them down like that and got rid of all the old job descriptions. But then we found that people weren't really sure if they were gonna be good at that. And because mm -hmm. a lot of times the population we have, social communication is a big challenge. So they can't say, hey, you know what? I'm really good at this, or I'm really bad at that. So instead we, we pulled out those boxes and Gina has been so great about taking them through sometimes three or four different samples of the jobs to see if they could do the quality assurance, to see if they could do the fine motor, to see what excites them. Yeah. And it breaks down barriers for them getting ownership of taking the job and we know we're putting them in a good fit. And so that's been really successful. I would say like 95% of the time, once in a while we've had to move people, but the company's been like, you're with us, let's find the best place for you. Right. So it's been successful. Awesome. Definitely exciting. Um, just to jump into a couple of questions. So I know that you briefly touched on what was kind of your background on why you wanted to start your company and get into the research and the everything that you're doing. James, I know that you have a similar background, a similar story. If you wouldn't mind just kind of talking about what was your inspiration in starting your company and doing what you do every day? Yeah, you know, I, so I have a physical disability myself. Um, I was born, I was born without a left hand, um, and so have lived my whole life with with a with a physical disability. And really, when I was at the University of Wisconsin and 18 years old, I was a business major. But I came home and actually had the opportunity on a summer job to work as a job coach um, for people with disabilities. And at that time, was a, a small town, of Wisconsin. In a sheltered workshop, um, and and just just really loved it, and and went back that that's that's my sophomore year to, to Madison and switched my major to to um, rehabilitation psychology, and really never looked back. Had the opportunity. Um, we we now have I have five I have five children. My two oldest daughters have have invisible intellectual disabilities. Um, so there's a personal passion here, right, from, from my background, but also from being a parent of two kids with disabilities who are, who are on their path, right, towards employment, or actually one is now working full time and um, living on her own. And, and, and so that's, that, that's really the passion. But it was really in 2004 when I met a gentleman named Randy Lewis um, from Walgreens. And for those of you uh, who aren't familiar with Randy Lewis, my one suggestion of a homework out of this, if anything, is to go to YouTube and, and put Randy Lewis Walgreens in. And you're going to hear some amazing speeches about the benefits of disability inclusion in a large scale basis. And, and for in the early 90s, there were a lot of um, a lot of uh, companies that had started disability inclusion and how in, in more scalable hiring of people with disabilities. But Randy is really the reason why we're all here today. Mm -hmm. I, I know there are other reasons, but the truth is, without Randy and his vision at Walgreens, I don't know if the field of disability inclusion or neurodiversity would be close to where it's at. And so, always give him the due. I had the, the supreme honor of working with him for two years in building the Walgreens Initiative, and then went on and 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 worked with other companies. And really, for me, I love working with individuals, but even more, I love working with companies and watching how, by in brand by brand, the realization comes into how if we create a disability inclusive environment, it's going to help us and it's going to help the community. But most of all, it's going to help us be a better operator, and and that's what I think we're seeing. And I think we're seeing that with the work that you all are doing at Penn Emblem. Yeah early on is is it's 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 great some great stories coming out of it but at the end of the day it's hopefully changing the way that you all think about work just you just get talked about an example and that's what i love some people love yeah. working with individuals what i love is to see companies changing the way they think about this population forever right yeah. that's that's really my inspiration yeah and it was actually interesting to me because i had spoken to gina pre-meeting just to kind of get a little bit of intel on what they've been doing and she was telling me about the fact that you know in my mind I think diversity it's like you know you think somebody who has some type of a handicap or autistic or something like that but it could be PTSD it could be ADHD there's so many other things that go into it that I think people don't really think about or are aware of um, Tiffany would you mind just kind of diving into that a little bit about what really encompasses 
a diverse workplace and also if I don't really know about like the numbers behind it or the statistics but what really are the numbers behind the unemployment like what number do we need to get to uh oh wow so <laughs> you know I talked a little bit about you know autism which we don't really have any idea of the unemployment people mm -hmm. guess about 80 to 90 percent unemployment rate wow um the challenge with you know a lot of things is 90%, 6% of disabilities are non-visible. Mm -hmm. So how do you create environments where people are willing to ask for help or to self-disclose? Mm -hmm. And that really comes down to the numbers. Like, And there's also a, a, a challenge now of our aging population, people coming out of wars with PST, yeah. um, but even, even more so, the diagnostic criteria for many things were were wrong. And like, for example, with autism, which is kind of my specialty, is um, it was not di really set up for women. So we're seeing a lot of women or we're seeing a lot of people who didn't have access to diagnosis or access to care younger, realizing in their you know 30s and 40s that they are autistic or becoming disabled. So the numbers really don't make sense, but they're high. I mean, yeah. when's the latest I could say is, you know, like 60% of the, I think, dysgraphia population is unemployed. I believe there was 40% um, of the ADHD. And then disabilities, there's so many different forms. It's yeah. really hard. Uh, I don't know if M James has some more statistics on that, but it's significant. So when you say diversity, what we try to think about is the diversity comes in how we think. Right. Not so much in how we use our body or everything else. So if you're providing somebody with an environment where you're giving them what they need and the way they think and the way they frame life to where they can access the ability not be disabled. So the environment itself disables people many times. Mm. It's not necessarily like, like my son's not disabled till he's in an environment where somebody doesn't give him a chance to talk the way he needs to talk or give him a chance to process what he's saying um, so we, we keep putting people in these, you know, areas of being disabled. So mm -hmm. Penn Emblem has been able to break that down and taking away the disability from people who have felt disabled their whole lives by right. being accommodating, by changing the way they interview and by being patient. I mean, we had somebody who was ready to jump ship and Miranda just said, no, I told you, you're stuck with us. If this <laughs> isn't working. Let's find something that works for you. Right. And she's now the happiest employee I see with the biggest smile on her face yeah. because they didn't give up on her and they supported her. So that's kind of what you got to think about. It's just the individual person and being embraced for their true self. Got it. And I know that you had mentioned, you know, the approaches that you're taking, how are we accommodating, having patients? One of my questions was, what steps do you teach to eliminate bias from a company's hiring process? James, Tiffany, whichever. I know you probably both have a great outlook on both. I mean, I, yeah, I'll start. I, w w one of the things that I think is is key, and and, and I love that Tiffany has worked with the, the facility in Mariloma about taking this to the nth degree, right? Um, in terms of the the work trials and the the on the job interview. It, what we do a lot is. For larger scale companies, um, for example, with Advance Auto or Reynolds or um, or some of the companies that we have that that have lots of sites across the country, one, we do what we call inclusive interview training, right? And it's a lot of what y'all just been talking about, right? Is giving people that, that do interviews the perspective that maybe things like eye contact in an interview don't matter as much as we think they matter, right? Mm -hmm. um, and don't necessarily represent whether a person is truly engaged or not. Right. Um, you know, and, you know, being as clear as possible in your approaches to, to not just interviewing, but screening, right? And uh, th that's the wonderment of what y'all have done at Penn Emblem is you've been so quick to be flexible. It's probably of any company I've worked with in the last 20 years, the, the flexibility across the, the, that, that employee life cycle that you mm -hmm. all have demonstrated has been better than ever, better than any company, right? And we love all our companies, but it, it's, it's a matter of, especially with bigger companies, 
trying to find that sweet spot of making sure that they can replicate what we're doing from site to site, but building that, building a different type of decision making into, into play, that maybe the old standards don't matter as much on how we judge people, like their body language in an interview, or yeah. maybe if there's a gap in the resume, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a bad employee, as a lot of recruiters think, right? Those right. things and, and kind of starting that retraining. I think Tiffany, I'll turn it to you. You've done kind of taking that to the nth degree with, with the folks at Penn Emblem on, on, on next level stuff. Right. Well, we've, we've worked on something called impression management. So we talk a lot about this. Um, I have a weekly meeting with the supervisors and we do a little mini lesson. Um, but what we talk about is it's not about you in the interview. It's mm -hmm. not about that person giving you what you need to make you feel good. Being in, you know, engaged in what you say, feeling, you know, telling you you're great and I can't believe you brought me in here. It's not about you. It's about them being a good employee and what does that really mean? So let's take out all that extra noise and let's focus on can they do the job? Will they show up? Do they have the communication skills to do what they need to do? Does that mean that they can, you know, talk for hours or whatever else? Is that really required if you're a clipper? You know, what is required? And so we revisit that a lot, that it's really not about you. It's about finding an employee and don't take out what you need to make yourself right. feel better. Bouncing off of what you're saying, it's not about you. What are some ways that we can educate other employees in the workplace on how to handle situations when interacting with someone who has, you know, a disability or whatever it is? Um, I know some people, like for me personally, I worked at a Fortune 500 company previous to this, and this wasn't really a topic. It wasn't something that we ever brought up or talked about. Um, not only did we not see it, but it wasn't something that we were trained on, you know, how to handle the best practices. So what would you guys recommend? Tiffany, why don't you start with some of the stuff on, on that? Um, to be honest, we start with they're human beings. And to be honest, that's, that's, I, you know, we have questions when people are afraid of, the elephant in the room. They're afraid of saying someone has a wheelchair. They're afraid of telling somebody what to do correctly because they think they're gonna be rude or judged. Mm -hmm. So what we've tried to do is say, there's no elephants in the room. The person knows they're in a wheelchair. So you know how to not talk about it. Right. Um, the person with autism, you're doing them a favor by being direct and not leaving any gray area because you're making them successful. So. It's been changing the fact that they're human beings. They can be talked to. They're not that delicate. Um, you know, talk to them like you would anybody else. Then if that doesn't work, try something else. But at least that. And I think the other thing that we've really tried to get through is how people process things differently. So right. we spent a lot of time with the team talking about, you know, memory, how some people take in information, how they're able to process it how they take it in auditorily, how they take it in visually. We want people, the supervisors especially, to be able to recognize that maybe the way they're training this individual or talking to this individual isn't registering. So maybe we, we need to try a different way. So we've given them a toolbox of saying, okay, we know this individual needs a color code because they can do matching better than they can just remember them. Maybe we need to have a multiplication table for one person because that's easier and faster and they're more confident. Are these things big deals? Not at all, but that's because they think and learn differently. Right, it's interesting. You know, and, and Carly, I think that's, those are all, I completely agree with everything you said. I think one of the things, one of the assumptions that as we go, as we're in, we as a company are growing dramatically um, because, because the companies out there need that loyal labor source, right? They need somebody who's going to show up, but when you think about current workforces, a lot of times when I go into a manufacturer or a distributor, first thing they ask me or one of the first questions is, well, our workforce isn't going to deal with this, right? They're not going to deal with, their, you know, it's a tough workforce, it's a tough workplace, right? We're not going to deal, they're not going to respond well to some kind of touchy-feely disability initiative, right? And that's what the employer is thinking, mm -hmm. but the truth is, right? just the opposite as tiffany said right it, it's all about people 
when when we do when we do team member trainings for companies like Advance Auto or Reynolds, we often see individuals who are on the work floor disclosing in those trainings, right? I have a learning disability, I have ADHD, I've gone through a mental health condition, right? Or I have a child with autism, or you know, and and what really seems to happen in even what we would classify as the hardest kind of workforces is a rally effect, right? Because yeah. disability. It, I love how Randy, if you watch some of Randy Lewis's, again, back to how he describes it currently, is disability isn't about niche or those folks over there, right? Disability is about all of us. We all know, nowadays, we all know somebody who has a disability, probably ourselves, but, yeah. you know, if not, um, right, the, we know somebody who has a disability. So if you can make it a little bit personal, right, we often see mm -hmm. rally effects that that run go around. And one of the other pieces I would say to the, the to current workforces is when you set the expectations that people with disabilities are not going to have to have lower standards or they're going to be in that area over there. They're going to be, no, they're going to be with us and yeah. they're going to meet the same expectations that you are meeting. Um, and it's not about charity, right? I think that also helps the workforce understand that this is just part of it and we see that rally effect. Yeah. And I know that Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say one thing that I've been most impressed with with Penn is is Gina Ramirez is has having her her supervisors come. But what we've done is we've created a safe place, and I try to say, okay, in this time, call anybody anything that comes out of your mouth. It's not wrong. It's okay. What concerns do you have? Let's just you know rip it open. Right. We've had honest conversations, and we've started that about three months ago. So now when we got 22 people working in there and, and things are coming up. We've created a, a environment of small conversations, environment of trust and an environment of, of, I know I might not say it right, but I just really want to do the right thing. And that's really unique to Penn Emblem to put that time in there and to get to know each individual to support them. Um, and so that's probably has been my favorite, favorite, favorite part about being there. That's awesome to hear. Um, I know that you had said different tools that have been implemented, like you were saying, like a multiplication table or something like that. Just, it's interesting to me because I think that leadership has been a big topic that I've been interested in researching. So just how managers work and how there's difference between managing and leading somebody. And I think that adding more diversity to the workplace is really challenging managers and people that are higher up to become better leaders because they have to adapt and how they interact with people. Um, do you think that, is there a cap on people with dis certain disabilities being able to move up the chain to become managers and become higher in leadership or is it, should it be open to anybody? Mommy, take this or you, James, you go. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, so that, I mean, that the key to building an inclusive workplace is thinking about careers, right, Carly? And that means yep. providing that opportunity to move up. Yep. We know part of the success of any initiative is is folks who are wanting and deserving that promotion get that promotion, right? And that career planning is done. Um, and I think that is a key part. And I, like you said, that's the difference between building leadership in a truly inclusive environment, that valuing differences and recognizing right. that folks with disabilities, are, they need to be leaders, right? They, we need that perspective in that you know, and one of my favorite stories around this is the Office Max Office Depot Distribution Center in Las Vegas has a, has a deaf employee, right, who was the best worker in that department, yet there was concerns about how do we make a deaf employee a team lead, right? How will he communicate with his, with his, with his, the folks he's supervising? How will that happen? Will there be, right? And, and, but they, they thought it through, they, they put a plan together, they looked at written communication, they looked at basic sign, and now if you would walk into that distribution center, you'd go into an area, and you'd see 20 people all signing, right, key, key terminology, right, and it, beca wow. it's, it, and what Office Max Office people would say is it's one of our most efficient departments, because there's no gossip going on, it's just, <laughs> it's just keyword <laughs> communication, right, and, but that's just a sample of, in that, it's important to, to, to think about that career progression. Um, and that's the great things about, about what you all are doing is not just trying to hire a few people and call it a day, right? right? But building an initiative that creates an environment that learns together. And part of that learning is, is, is moving people up through the chain. Yeah. 
Absolutely. It's also too, though, is the, um, the part of not everybody wants to be moved up, but they still want to move forward. Right. So that's something with the, with our population we work with is just find some alternate paths to, to moving up. Maybe it's a lateral move, but I still want to move up in responsibility. I want to move up in pay, but I'm right. not necessarily someone who wants to manage people. Right. So it's providing those different ways of still rewarding people for good work, but not putting them, forcing them into a role that they don't want or they're not meant to be in. Absolutely. And I like that, James, that you said um, it kind of shifted the way that that workplace was, where it was somebody was deaf, so everybody kind of had to learn sign language, which I think is cool because it's not just advancing a certain group of people, it's growing the entire organization as a whole. Like, I would love to learn sign language. That's something on my list, you know? Yeah. Um, but to bounce off of that, it kind of made me think of the shift that we experienced in 2020 with the digital era how, you know, especially even for Pen Emblem, it's like a lot of us had to adapt in the technology that we, we were using to communicate working from home and stuff like that. Um, how do you think that that shift into the digital age where a lot of things are online, a lot of people are working from home and looking for remote opportunities, how does that play a factor into people with disabilities and hiring? Well, I'll, I'll let I'll let Tiffany answer the bulk of this. I I would because because she's so she has she's so good with thinking through the all the different roles. But but I have two things I would quickly say to that. Number one is. Uh, the generally the disability community says working from home right is the assumption is that's going to be good for a lot of folks who struggle with travel and transportation and mobility mm -hmm. and i think that's true but i also think you can't just plop somebody in front of a computer and without the 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 the, the tr traditional support and say here we go everything solved right, right. Um, and that's one of the things i've been concerned about some of the at at home work and then the, the last piece of that is when you do have somebody at home now, how do you define inclusion, right? When mm -hmm. somebody's working for full from home, what does inclusion then look like in the company? So I think right. are, it's some interesting pushes and pulls. Yeah, think. definitely. Yeah. No, I mean, I agree with everything James just said. It's, it's, it's this assumption that, for example, people um, with autism don't really like to have social communication, so they're happier at home. Well, we're finding a lot of people are really lonely right now through COVID. Yeah. And so you really can't generalize any person. Right. Meaning regardless of it, any human being in general. Um, but also we're finding that people are not sure how to be inclusive when they're on video chats. And mm -hmm. do they open the chat box? Do they send the questions beforehand? Are they allowing people who process slower or are a little bit more introverted an opportunity to speak to a meeting when they don't know how to jump in on those pauses? Right. Um, right. Who's going to speak? It's it's challenging. I, I mean, I have it with my team too, where, you know, who, who's jumping in or who's more obnoxious of a speaker or more comfortable <laughs> with people getting the floor. So how do you create an environment where people who aren't are still getting access and right. complete involvement in the team? Right. That's huge. And I, you're definitely right. I think we experience people like that in every single company, <laughs> no matter what type of meeting you're in. Um, in your opinion, um, for both of you, what is one of the most challenging aspects of working in a diverse environment? I guess, what are some of the hardest things that people have to overcome that would be good for employers to be aware of, um, whether it's other employees interacting with them or just different challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I think Tiffany's done a good job of talking about how that this has played out in, in your facility in, in California is yeah. just the, the just the honesty. Um, the, the biggest challenge in a diverse is is not it, it is valuing differences to the point where you feel like if there's a question burning in your mind, you have a, you have the opportunity to ask that, right? Mm -hmm. And not walking on politically correct eggshells, right? And I think that is one of the things that's happening as diversity increases in companies is it's great to see, but to really build an inclusive environment, not just a diverse environment, but an inclusive environment, right? Means right. being able to share and express our differences and it's so much easier said that I can say that, but it's so much easier <laughs> said, said than done. And right. he's led some of that strategic intention in, in your facility in there alone. But I think one of the hardest thing um, for any company is, is the episodic nature of a lot of disabilities or conditions. Right. So you might have somebody who's doing great, but then something triggers them and they're not doing great. 
So how do you handle when we go from great to not great and support? Um, right. How do we handle that change? You know, it could be a chronic pain flare up. It could be, you know, um, somebody who's autistic and has had the tremendous day of getting there of everything going wrong and not to schedule and they're completely agitated and then something else goes off schedule and they just, you know, emotionally go. So that's, I think, the <laughs> hardest thing for any company to manage. And that goes along when you go to mental health in general, you know, mental health, disabilities, neurodiversities, all that. When they're not consistent, that's when it's hard. And that's really the reality of it is we are all okay sometimes and we're all not okay, but can we mask it and get through or can we not? A lot of people don't have the skills or they lose the skills. And that's where you really see the, the company shine. Yeah. And they can support those types of occurrences. And we've seen that with the team in Loma, uh, Loma, Mara Loma. They've been, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, they've been really supportive of when people have those opportunities and, right. and communicating with them that you're safe here, your job is secure, um, constantly reminding them that this is different here. Yeah. We're not just going to fire you because you're having a moment. Like we're here to support you. We're in for the long haul and they feel so safe and protected once they keep hearing that. Right. And it's just creating such a nice environment. Right. Would you say that for employers looking to hire, is it fear that predominantly holds people back from hiring people with disabilities? That's my whole dissertation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my whole dissertation is on why um, human resources individuals or people who role, are in those roles don't hire people or candidates. What's causing them to do it? And usually it's, you know, to be honest, it's ignorance. It's fear of doing it, doing it wrong. Right. Saying it wrong. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of fear about understanding how the ADA works, the, um, the laws and how to interpret them. And they aren't really well written. So instead of doing it wrong, let's just not do it at all is usually, usually the case. Mm. So that's um, what we try to break down those barriers in my group is, you know, from a human resource perspective of, of it is doable. It's okay. Right. You know what I mean? But yeah, fear. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm looking forward to reading your dissertation. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> because because that, that is absolutely, it's not, there's not even an, I mean, there's not a close number to, right? You, you, when you list out all the advantages, Carly, the business advantages of doing this, right? One of the last untapped labor forces, equal productivity, equal or better safety rates, way reduced turnover, financial incentives that are external. The business case goes on and on. It's why we're growing as a company. But when companies choose not to go with us, at the core of that decision is the fear and the stigma that this still just can't work because people with disabilities can't keep up. And, and, and I and we have not done a good job of listening to that company and helping convince them that this can happen. So I'm excited, Tiffany, to hear your recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> your expectation's too high. <laughs> <laughs> um, James, how do you think that the recent, I mean, unemployment rates going up because of COVID are going to play a factor in us lowering the unemployment rates for people with disabilities since there's a little bit more competition in that field now? This is our window, really, in a very yeah. interesting and, and strange twist of fate. Yeah. This, I, especially in the industries that we focus in, this is our window. To a company that three years ago would say to me, nope, not thinking about it, not considering it, even if you, with all the statistics, because of that fear and stigma, now is saying, okay, come in and talk to us about this, right? Because, right. because we're, we just, I was out last week with a company and in their building of 500 people, they're 100 people short. So they're running a 500-person wow. building with 400 people. And, and they're not able to, they're struggling to get that product out. And, and they're struggling to be efficient. And their primary, their, their number one barrier by far is getting labor, right? And so when you yeah. think about the stimulus money right now, you think about the lack of understanding of working in essential businesses, especially, this is a huge opportunity for us to help uh, companies understand the dramatic benefits of creating a disability inclusive 
And I don't know how long this is going. This window will be open. Some say long, some say short. But in my opinion, we really need to jump through it as aggressively as we can as a field of disability inclusion and neurodiversity. Yeah, I think the important thing is it's not just hiring, and if we need companies to make sure they realize it. It's not just hiring. You just don't bring them in, and it's ta-da, right. problem solved. Um, and so that's, I think, one of the biggest fears I always have is is they think it's that simple. Okay. It's not because of all the issues we've talked about in the last, you know, 40 minutes or so. Right. Um, so companies have to know that there's a culture impacted too when you're being open to people being different and you're yeah. having to change the way you accept people. Um, it doesn't just happen overnight. Yeah. You have to invest. Yeah. I think 2020 has definitely opened that topic of discussion in a lot of areas between, you know, racial diversity, gender diversity, every type of diversity. I think a lot of companies are definitely more open to it now and they're listening, they're hearing people, which is really exciting to see. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's part, I mean, Tiffany, I think Tiffany's right, right? You just, you, that building that culture and for so long, again, in, in these these industries, especially where we're talking about distribution and manufacturing, there's been a lack of openness in general of companies to kind of convert into a different culture. It's worked, right, in general. Mm -hmm. And, and but now it's not working. And and so that I think that that opportunity to, to try to build that culture systematically and be able to do that is is second to, is second to none right now yeah. and it'll be quite interesting to see what the what the future brings over the last next couple of years yeah absolutely i also think when you invest in the culture um right now since there's so many buckets people are trying to place them in the gender the color the religion everything else if we we think about all those different buckets you think about people with disabilities or neurodiversities they can fall in any of those buckets yeah so we need to stop trying to just focus on one little piece of the inclusion and the diversity. We need to focus on the whole person and then we won't have to bucket. Yeah. And it's going to be a lot more cost effective for our companies. It's going to make a longer difference right now. There's so many companies that are trying to solve each little PR big thing and they're yep. focusing on those and they're missing out on an opportunity to just do it right for right. all the different diversities in one swoop and create the culture that needs to be. So yeah. it just kills me to see that all this wasted energy is going into these efforts. Yeah, that's definitely true. And I think that's something I'm most excited about is just seeing people for their personality and who they are as a person, not the disability, the color of their skin, the religion, whatever else it is. It's, it really means nothing at the end of the day. So I'm glad that you touched on that. Um, two more questions, then we can wrap it up. So my Basically, my final question is, what has been the biggest reward in the mission that both of you are working towards from start to now? What has been the biggest gratification for both of you? James, if you wanted to start. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, uh, for me, it's it's providing, working from the demand side and being able to provide opportunities for people with disabilities when maybe they haven't had it, right? And and that's there are some people who are so good in working on if you will the supply side and and building and helping people with disabilities through job training and through preparation and all that and i did that for a while but that's that really is not even that that wasn't me right what has really inspired me is being able to try to open up opportunities and work with companies who it's an amazing thing when the light comes on and they start seeing that value as as an organization right and it's a journey but but um for me that that is the beauty of working here and being able to create opportunities for people who have not had those in the past definitely you know i i find as i talked about those small conversations and seeing people's comfort levels change but to be honest it's going up to somebody during the work day and saying how are you doing yeah. I'm doing good. I really like working here. I really feel good about this. Or I've never been able to keep a job more than so and so days, and and I'm here and I'm doing really well. Um, those types of comments and hearing those from people and seeing them smile and happy. And you know, we just had one guy. You know, he sat there and he's got this job where he's it's kind of more of a side to side motion. He's really tall and he's in a walker, so it's a little harder to go side to side change your environment. He goes, what? Just change your environment. Make it yours. You're taller. We'll reach up. What? What? <laughs> like, you know, those types of things, those are what fuel your soul to keep doing this. It's yeah. all those little wins. Yeah. Um, that's what makes me happy. 
Definitely. And I think my biggest takeaway from this was one of them was you saying that specifically at Pen Emblem, the work that we're doing, people are feeling safe. And I think that kind of makes my heart warm because it's always nice knowing that the people that you get to work alongside with feel like they're being taken care of. The world that we live in today can be very scary. You know, there's always different things coming on the news, but to know that you feel safe in your workplace is something that's really, really important. And I'm proud that my company's doing that and that you guys are helping us do that. Um, so thank you. And my final question is, where can people connect with you? Where can they find your resources? Where can they read your dissertation? <laughs> um, still writing it. <laughs> yeah. um, if you don't mind just sharing where we can connect with you. Awesome. That's a long well, one. So for us, so, and, and, and yeah, I got a, we got a long <laughs> one. We're, um, so it's, it's, so it's James Emmett, so it's my name spelled out, I think it is. So it's J-A-M-E-S. E M M E T T, and then the letter and company and and company spelled out James Emmett and company dot com. But if you Google if you Google James Emmett and disability, you'll be you'll get directed right to our website. And I would say, Carly, you know this part of part of what I'm impressed with with Pen Emblem is this right the fact that you and the team have dedicated resources and time to recognize and value autism awareness month and and diversity awareness month right so this bigger picture of of that so i just thank you to you and and to the team at pen emblem for recognizing and giving us this time and this space to do and i as if people want to follow up with me i'm happy to happy to answer any emails so thanks carly of course thank you and um, I'm at Grit and Flow, G R I T A N D F L O W dot com. And uh, you can contact us, book some time to talk on our website. Um, we have also a webinar coming up, which is a whole work we've done on women with autism. Oh, okay. and the challenges of that. So it's a free webinar. We've spent a whole month educating people. So if you want to kind of see it from a different perspective, you can check that out for free. It's, it's, it's just, it's good to continue to educate yourself on different perspectives of diversity and neurodiversity. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then um, are there any specific resources that you would recommend for anyone that's looking to get educated more on Autism Awareness Month or Diversity Awareness Month? Anything specific that you can think of or ways to, for people to get involved? I know for myself, if this wasn't put on my radar, it wouldn't really be something that I would have sought after to go do and get involved in, but I want to be more involved. I would say making, um, if you want to get involved, start doing a lunch and learn, have somebody come in and talk about it with people and make them aware, start embracing the people that you currently have in your organization. You know what I mean? Like there's so many yeah. resources you can Google, whatever you want to Google to learn right. more about, you know, autism or ADHD or disabilities. But when it comes down to it, you can make a difference by having a lunch and learn, hosting it, starting an employee resource group where you're providing support to parents with people with disabilities or um, you know, people with disabilities themselves, giving them a voice, giving them a community. And what we find that a lot of times those organizations that start with the people tell the management, we need to address this because there's so many people already in your organization that are probably disabled or neurodivergent. And if you start supporting them, it's gonna play itself forward first. Got it. Um, I, and I think that's exactly right. That's how I would recommend. There's a lot of resources out there. Carly, one of the, the other pieces, there's, there's an organization in, in, in the United States called Disability In, um, and it's, it's just disabilityin, uh, disabilityin.org. It's, a, it's an organization designed for businesses to talk to businesses about disability inclusion. Um, and it's a good place to at least get some more information and begin the conversation. Um, I, feel, I still think specific action is, is as if you recommend, the best way to start. But if you're looking for some, some good resources and talk to some other companies, disabilityin.org is a good website. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you taking the time and enduring all of my questions. <laughs> um, I know speaking for Pen Emblem, we're very excited to be working with both of you and very appreciative of everything that's come out of it so far, which is making us more excited for what we're going to see for the rest of 2021 and so on. Um, and we're just grateful to be working with you guys. Well, I'm grateful to be there. It's a fun group. Yeah. Awesome. All thank right. You, Carly. Thanks for having us. Thanks, of course. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Right. Yeah.